God is good. All the time. All the time. And all the time. God is good. A blessed Sabbath to all of you. Amen. I thank God for this special privilege of being a part of this weekend stressing personal purity. Purity in all the areas of the life. Mm -hmm. I thank God for using Brother Ernest, who is the human instrumentality through him, through whom the invitation came. And uh, I am truly grateful because preaching is a tremendous privilege. Mm -hmm. And I thank God for it. I thank God for Pastor Hart, my friend and classmate from way back, for allowing me to occupy this sacred desk. And I thank my Heavenly Father for the privilege of rubbing his shoulders with all those children of his who will be making a variety of presentations during the course of this weekend. And I hope you will make a concentrated effort to be present, that you may benefit as much as possible. My wife is not on my side, physically, but spiritually. She's back in Michigan. So God bless her, and there are some people watching online in Africa, they're friends of mine. So please, once in a while, say Amen. Amen. Yeah. So they will appreciate what I'm saying. Yeah. I am also delighted to spend another weekend with the Nwachuku family, led by His Royal Highness King Udo, seated next to Queen Ada. Since I'm in a royal family, then I must be a prince. Somebody say amen. amen. So thank you again, my dear friends, for allowing me to disrupt your home for one weekend. I'm very grateful. I have some friends who are visiting from the Romalinda area, the Colton, the Redlands area. I have the Whitecliffe family right in the front. God bless you. Always nice to see you. These people live in my heart. I have the Delacruz family standing back there. God bless you. I know they don't like to stand. They're shy. The closer you come to Christ, the shy you are. You notice that? Yeah. Uh, are the Calabos here? Where are uh, they? They are the Delotes. Are they here? Uh, there they are. Families of mine that I love. Anyone else whom I love from Loma Linda calls and Redlands? I don't want to miss anyone. All right. It is now 12 o'clock. I will do everything in my power to release you by one. One person say amen. <laughs> I will do all of my power to release you by one. Amen. All right. Before I begin, do three things for me. And they're all relatively simple. Favor number one, if you have a cell phone, and I know you do have one, some of you have two, please, as a favor to God, amen. turn them off. Don't text in the presence of God. Amen. He may kill you. <laughs> Why are you laughing? God is a very serious God. Amen. You know, sometimes I believe we think the Bible says, let us make God in our image. Mm -hmm. God is a holy God. Amen. When the angels come into his presence, they fail their thesis. Don't text in the presence of God. Please turn all your phones off. Favor number two, while I'm speaking, pray for me. And what I'd like you to say is, Lord, put your words in that man's mouth. That is based on Jeremiah chapter 1 verse 9, which says, Then the Lord put forth his hand and touched my mouth. And the Lord said unto me, Behold, I have put my words in thy mouth. My words cannot heal you, they cannot help you, they cannot give life, but God's words can. Yeah. And favor number three, I want you very much to think. Come now, says the Bible, and let us do what? Reason together. That's an invitation from Christ. In Mark chapter 12, reading from verse 28, the Bible says, And one of the scribes came, and having heard them, reasoning together. Jesus reasoned. Paul, Acts 17 and 18. He reasoned, Acts 24. He reasoned of righteousness and justice, judgment, and of course, the resurrection. So we must think. Let's bow our heads and pray. 
Dear God in heaven, before you, before me, is a church of sinners. And standing for them in this pulpit is a sinner. Now God, all of us need your grace. We really need your grace, dear God. And I ask you in the name of Jesus, with heaven and earth as my witnesses, help us. Help me by speaking through me. Help those who are listening by enlightening their understanding, Father. Through your power that no one can resist, restrain the forces of darkness, that we may worship in peace. Father, let every heart receive the truth gladly. I pray not only for us, but wherever your people are worshiping you on this holy day around this world, bless them with your intimate presence. Amen. Father, let the word exert a converting influence on every mind. I offer this prayer from my heart. In Jesus' name, let all God's people say, Amen. Amen. Before I get into the message, which is entitled, Do This and Live. What did I say? Do this and live. Who is visiting with us who is not a Seventh-day Adventist? Amen. 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 You are not a Seventh-day Adventist. Man. Ah, God bless you. Would you stand, please? If you're not a Seventh-day Adventist, please stand. Stand, sir. Amen. Amen. Stay standing, stay standing, stay standing, don't sit. I have one in the balcony, uh, rest on the main floor. On behalf of Seventh-day Adventists all over the world. How many of us are there? 17 million? Somewhere around there. I thank you for taking your time to come and distinguish this service with your presence. Amen. We are happy you've come. Yes. Let the church say, Amen. Amen. And may God bless you, bless your families, bless your health, bless your wealth, and protect you from harm and danger. When earthquakes hit California, may he protect your house. Amen. Amen. I'm not joking. And may he place upon you the divine wisdom to come back. Amen. Thank you. Be seated. God bless you. Amen. This do and live. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25. And I'm reading from the King James Version. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25. Luke is the third gospel. Luke was a medical doctor, but he was, he is better known for his preaching than for his medicine. Isn't that a nice way to be a doctor? More spiritual healing than physical, because you cannot separate the two. Well, from God's perspective, the world tries, but from God's point of view, the two go together. Luke was the only Bible writer who was not a Jew. Luke chapter 10, reading from verse 25, the Bible says, And behold, a certain lawyer stood and tempting him, saying, Master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? An excellent question. Notice the word inherit. He wasn't asking, what shall I do to save myself? Because no one inherits anything from himself. Are you with me? Amen. Inheritance means I get something from someone else. Amen. And so his question was, what shall I do? Not just believe. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And Jesus Christ, without correcting the question with one iota, because it was an appropriate question, the Bible says, He said unto him, What is written in the law? How readest thou? It's very interesting that when the lawyer asked about salvation, Christ sent him to the law. Now we know the law doesn't save anyone. 
but no one can be saved whose life is not consistent with God's law. Amen. Are you with me? Amen. And so Jesus says, what is written in the law, how readest thou? Christ was big on reading. In Matthew 5, 19, reading from verse 3, the Bible says, The Pharisees also came unto him, tempting him, and saying unto him, Is it lawful for a man to put away his wife for every cause? And he answered and said unto them, Hath he not read? If we would read, we would not be puzzled about whether we should keep the feasts or not. If we would read, and by read I mean study. Because people read the newspaper, they don't study. I mean read as a study. If we would read, we would not be led astray by the 2520 prophecy that is so popular among Adventists. If we would read, we would realize that we're not like everybody else. Amen. Amen. If we would read, we would understand that the atonement of Christ did not end on the cross. Amen. Amen. If only God's people would read. Amen. Amen. And so Jesus said, what is written in the law, how readest thou? And he answered and said, thou shalt love the Lord thy God with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, and with all thy strength and with all thy mind, and thy neighbor as thyself. And he said unto them, Thou hast answered right. This do, and thou shalt live. My sermon is not about the law, but I love the law. I believe God has put a conviction on my heart to lift up the law wherever I go. You know, that was one of the missions of Christ according to Isaiah 42, 21. He shall magnify the law and make it honorable. Amen. But that's not my mission today. Jesus said, thou hast answered right. This do and live. In the Old Testament, the New Testament, the Bible is clear. Anyone who does the law will live. For he that doeth them shall live in them. Of course, what you also need to add is that you can do them outside of Christ. Amen. Amen. But Jesus said, thou hast answered right, this do and live. This do and live. Thou shalt live. Now, let's look at Christ talking to someone else who has the precise question. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 18, as we continue with the subject, do this. And live is now 12.15. Let me worry about the time. I want you to relax and just listen to the message. Amen. Luke chapter 18, reading from verse 18, the Bible says, And a certain ruler asked him, saying, Good master, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? It's the same question. Jesus said unto him, Why callest thou me good? None is good, save one that is God. Thou knowest the commandments. On the second occasion, Jesus directs the inquirer to the law. Now I need to say this because we live in an age when churches preach there is no law. Yep. I was listening to a gentleman called Creflo Dollar. God bless him, God loves him, God died for him. Are you with me? Yes. God is like much of what he says, but God loves him. And he said, Jesus does not want us to obey those 10 things. I heard him. Just love God and love your neighbor. Which is a tricky response people have to the law. Because the Bible tells us, love God and love our neighbor. And so Jesus told this rich young ruler, Thou knowest the commandments. Do not commit adultery. Of course, Christ does not go chronologically. As Dr. Levin said last night, adultery goes up front. You look at the list of sins in the Bible, adultery fornication is usually fairly, are usually fairly up close to the front of the list. Thou knowest the commandments, do not commit adultery, do not kill, do not steal, do not bear false witness, honor thy father and thy mother. Amen. And he said, all these have I kept from my youth up. It is a glorious example of self-delusion. Because the law of Christians, 
who would stand in God's face and tell God, I have done everything. <laughs> and so he told God, all these have I kept from my youth up. Now when Jesus heard these things, he said unto him, yet lackest thou, how many things? One thing. I am not a professional surveyor, but my guess is most people will be lost because of one thing. One area in the life that they refuse to conquer. And so Jesus told the lawyer in Luke chapter 10, this do, do this one thing and thou shalt live. He tells the rich young ruler in Luke 18, yet lackest thou one thing. Sell all that thou hast. <laughs> How much was he told to sell? Oh. How much do you give to God when you give your life? Oh. Oh. Most of us give some of our lives to God. That's why there are so many miserable Christians. In Ministry of Healing, page 480, paragraph 3, Ellen White writes, Many who profess to be Christ followers have an anxious, troubled heart because they are afraid to trust themselves with God. They do not make a complete surrender to Him for they shrink from the consequences that such a surrender may evolve unless they do make this surrender. They cannot have peace. And so Jesus said, sell all that thou hast and distribute to the poor and thou shalt have treasure in heaven and come, finish it for me. Follow me. Follow me. One thing, by the way, as a means of a digression, to follow Christ is to have life. Amen. You know, Jesus said in John 8 verse 12, the Bible says, then spake Jesus again unto them, saying, I am the light of the world. He that followeth me shall not walk in darkness, but shall have the light of life. So to follow Christ is to live. Amen. It's to have his life. And so when Jesus told the rich young ruler, follow me, he invited him to receive the very thing he inquired about. Uh, you're not listening to me. Amen. You see me with your eyes open. <laughs> follow me says Jesus Christ do this one thing do this and live is our subject and I want to identify today is the burden God put on my heart one thing that makes an incalculable contribution to the weaknesses we're dealing with this weekend sexual weaknesses, immorality In the book, Maranatha, page 62, paragraph 5. You can write this quotation down at the reference, not the quotation. Eloi writes these words. Remember we did with do this and live. Before I give you that quotation, let me give you this one. Which contains the concept of morality and immorality. In Heavenly Places, page 194, paragraph 3. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to men. There is adultery a moral evil, yes or no? Is fornication a moral evil? Is pornography a moral evil? Is uh, lesbianism a moral evil? Is homosexuality a moral evil? I mean the behaviors. Is uh, bestiality a moral evil? Is incest a moral evil? Listen to the words of inspiration. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to man. Which means, if you consider the word foundation, what effectively lies on the foundation? Nothing. The foundation is the very bottom that supports all that is above. Are you with me? Amen. If we can deal then with this one thing. Have I lost you? No. Have I offended you? No. Why do you look so dead? I'm not joking, you look dead. Or are you processing what I'm saying? Yeah. Ah, okay, well then I have sinned, forgive me. 
<laughs> Look alive when you forgive. Intemperance lies at the foundation of all the moral evils known to man. Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. Amen. Amen. When she says the ruin, what is she referring to? The sin of Adam and Eve. Listen to the words again. Christ began the work of redemption just where the ruin began. So where the problem began is where Jesus Christ began. The problem began with intemperance. Christ began the work of redemption on that point. And I shall show that to you in a minute. Mm. The fall of our first parents was caused by the indulgence of appetite. Amen. Amen. Now, Adventists love to eat. And I've always believed one of the most dangerous things you can do is to cut the line at an Adventist bottle. Are you with me? You didn't get it. Don't cut the line at an Adventist bottle. You may not live to eat that food because we are committed to food. We love to eat. And God invented eating. Come on, somebody say amen. amen. He invented drinking as well. And in the new world, he has a rage. We will also have to eat. Amen. Spirit of Prophecy, Volume 1, page 69, paragraph 1. We read these powerful words. In order for man to retain an endless life, he must continue to eat of the fruit of the tree of life. Amen. Deprived of that tree, his life would gradually wear away. So eating was arranged by God before sin, during sin, and after sin. Amen. So eating is not the problem. Our first parents fell because of the indulgence of appetite. Listen to how the quotation ends in Heavenly Places, page 194, paragraph 3. In the work of redemption, or in redemption, the denial of appetite is the first work of Christ. Now the other first things, last night we learned the first thing. Christian Tempers and Bible Hygiene, uh, page 136, paragraph 1. The first work of anyone who is interested in a reform is to purify the imagination. That's the first thing. There's another first thing, which is the denial of appetite. When we hear the word appetite, we always think of food. There's appetite for food. There's appetite for sexual expression. They're both appetites. Some people have an appetite that they can't control for partying. Some have an appetite for drugs. The appetite is a desire, it's an urge, it's a yearning for something. In redemption, the denial of appetite is the first work of Christ. This is biblically very evident because when Jesus contemplated when he was about to begin his public ministry, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 4, reading from verse 1, then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. Now Satan was and remains the smartest person in the universe next to God. I heard a couple of groans, but you didn't hear what I said. Amen. Amen. Let me say it again. The only person in the universe smarter than Satan is God. Amen. Satan is not disorganized. Remember, he was once the highest angel. The Bible says in Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1083, paragraph 1, Bear in mind that it is none but God who can hold an argument with Satan. Yes. Wow. Christ's triumphant page, 190, paragraph 4. Christ had been warned not to enter into argument with Satan. Mm -hmm. In his humanity, the Father warned him, don't argue with him. Amen. 
Amen. This is the power you and I are up against. That's right. Mm -hmm. Amen. Thessalonians 41, page 341, paragraph 1. These disturbing words, oh, God alone can limit the power of Satan. Amen. Not Gabriel. Mm -hmm. Now, keeping this in mind, here comes the devil. Then was Jesus led up of the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. And when he had fasted 40 days and 40 nights, he was afterward hungry. and hungered. Mm -hmm. Now, that's just about six weeks. Six, seven is 40 days. Six weeks. Satan could have come anytime from day one on. He came when Christ was at his most vulnerable. Yep. Satan is tactical. What do I mean by that? He chooses not only his target, but the time to attack the target and his battleground. That's right. Amen. If you think you can outsmart Satan, mm -hmm. all the evil angels in heaven, uh, not heaven, in hell, are laughing right now, and the holy angels are crying. And when the tempter came to him, he said, If thou be the Son of God, command that these stones be made bread. Satan attacked Christ in the very area where he attacked Adam. Because Christ was the second Adam, or the, the last Adam, as the Bible calls it. Where the first Adam fell is where the first Adam had to conquer. Amen. 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 <clears throat> now, a quotation I promised you. Maranatha, page 62, paragraph 5. As we continue the subject, do this and live. Listen carefully. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands who, if they had conquered on this point, how many points? One. What's our subject? Do this. Do this and live. And live. Amen. Listen again. Let me repeat again. The controlling power of appetite will prove the ruin of thousands who, if they had conquered on this point would have had the moral power to gain the victory over every other temptation. Amen. Amen. Uh, you're not impressed. Amen. Amen. You're not impressed. Yeah. I'm impressed. I'm impressed. Do you understand what we're being told by the pen of inspiration? If there's one area in the life to conquer in order to guarantee spiritual growth, conquer appetite. The conquer appetite is not just to conquer how much you eat. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's to conquer what you eat. When you eat. And maybe where you eat. And with whom you eat. I'm stretching it a little bit, but you get my drift. Amen. Surely it is not just how much you eat, yes. When and what. I've observed, after a very, very careful and unscientific survey, <laughs> it's my own survey, I like it. <laughs> Most of our suffering is unnecessary. Yes. <clears throat> I don't hear anything from the balcony. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> when people in the band you think they're spectators looking down on you. <laughs> is that where it is up there? Oh, one brother shook his hand. He spoke for all of you. Thank you. Uh, listen to me again. Most of the suffering that we undergo is unnecessary. Amen. The fact that sin entered the world did not have to mean that we should have come to such a sorry state.
if we would obey God. Now, I'll just use a word most people don't like, including Christians. What's that word? Obey. I love to obey. Christians will do everything except obey. They will negotiate with God.